<clears throat> okay. Are you able to hear me clearly? Are you able to hear me clearly? Okay, thanks. Thank you. Very clear. OK, so now today's lesson is an introduction to the water resources in Singapore. OK, so just a very brief history and uh, the efforts taken by PUB to augment the water so resources within Singapore. OK, <clears throat> yeah. So. What, what we can see is we are still dependent on main, a main source of water supply is uh, still from many Malaysia. OK, so you can see that in this slide. There are three uh, pipelines, OK, pipelines are across the causeway. Uh, transporting water from Malaysia to Singapore. OK, so this this is how the water drinking water, particularly the water so water resource from Malaysia is brought into Singapore through these three pipelines. You can see that these pipelines are also fixed with uh, a thrust block because you know these are the thrust block, which are the concrete sections. Uh, which will hold the pipe when the water is traveling through the water the, through through the pipe. Again, it is also you can see three pipes there. There's the same pipes which I showed you in the previous slide. So uh, yeah, the question is how they want to eliminate, okay, or possibly reduce the water dependency. Uh, in, uh, actually, the Alternate sources of water supply was started off in 1965. Okay, so at that time there was no uh, no the membrane technology was not available. We didn't we, we, no no one used membrane at that time. It was in the early stages of uh, its development. Okay, so there was no no technology which was available to adapt using membrane filtration process. So the so they resorted the PUB resorted to what we call conventional thinking. What are the conventional thinking? First is to make op, op, optimize all inland water resources. Inland water resources means actually the reservoirs that we have in, in within Singapore, reservoirs, natural reservoirs. OK, OK, so that is uh, to make it a little more deeper and also to collect more water is what we call augmentation and optimization. OK, and in addition to that, all the estuaries were dammed. Estuaries are uh, very small quantity of water, but it is essential for Singapore. So therefore, you can see that they have dammed estuaries to collect the rainwater and uh, preserve them for drinking and it is to be treated for drinking water standards. In addition to that, in the 1980s, 83, they also adopted what we call diversion of rainwater from stormwater channels. OK, so this uh, this pro pro project was introduced in, in 1982 to 80, 84 or 1985, where the PUB constructed rainwater holding tanks and uh, they were able to develop the bed of reservoir and uh, and also collect the rainwater in the within the uh, tank which is actually the retention tanks 
and then transfer the water into the bed of reservoir. So that is the scheme which I want to explain to you. This is one of the schemes where rainwater was rainwater collected through the uh, drainage, okay, drainage channels. Okay, it is not the sewage water, but actually the rainage drain, which is actually the storm water channels. And then it diverted into holding tanks. And from the holding tanks, it is pumped right into the bed of reservoir. So that is one of the efforts, which is rainwater collection scheme. Okay, <clears throat> then in addition to these, they were also focusing more on leakage detection and limiting the unaccounted water. This was a major, major effort. They were trying to detect any possibilities of, uh, of leakage from the main transmission mains, and uh, they were replaced by new pipes. And it, uh, the leakage was limited to six to seven point per percentage, which is relatively the lower uh, leakage losses that uh, PUB is encountering from the distribution piping. Okay, so leakage detection and limiting unaccounted water also saved a substantial amount of water for Singapore. Okay, in addition to that, of course, they introduced mandatory installation of water saving devices like thimbles and very other devices to limit the, the water usage. Okay, so and also to reduce the water which is uh, which you, which comes through the taps and other utilities. Okay, so therefore there were mandatory mandatory requirements to use water saving devices. Okay. Sorry. Are you all able to hear me clearly, very clearly? Yeah. Is, is, uh, is the sound is okay? Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Right. So this is these are the efforts which was taken to reduce the dependency on uh, for, for water dependency from Malaysia. Okay, so these are the early stages they were doing uh, introducing this. The the last effort was actually higher water tariff for domestic use. Then that means if you are going to use more water, you will be charged more. Uh, usually it is a, uh, a limit more than 40 meter cube per month is considered as a high end usage of water. So the, the ex more than 40 meter cube per month will be charged at a much higher rate tariff rate than the amount utilized be below 40 meter cube per day. Oh, sorry, per, per 40 meter cube per month. So, the, so there were altogether uh, six efforts which was introduced, okay, with the expectation to reduce the water usage and water dependency, okay, and uh, and of course later days I think it was all initiated in 1965, and in the later days in the 2000 year 2000 and after. The PUB was going in for the production of new water using membrane technology, and it is uh, taking off the pressure on drinking water. And mainly, and uh, new water is essentially uh, used for uh, industrial industrial purposes, and it is also for non potable usage. Okay, so so we are just simply going to go through what are these, uh, how, what are the water resources which are available in in Singapore and how uh, how uh, unconventional water, which means water resources, unconventional means actually the the water which is produced by a new water plants. And also, industrial water plants are, are known as um, 
non portable water to be used for non portable use. OK, so we are going to go through. How this uh, development took over to place in S Singapore. So the first this thing is actually first effort was to dam all the estuaries and essentially you can see that these are very small ponds. In other words, reservoirs which are quite small, but there is no alternative. So all these estuaries were dammed. OK, how do they dam actually you need to construct a bun, OK, which segregates the water. OK, uh, gaining uh, uh, collect the water, rainwater at the same time it segregates it from going into the sea. In other words, it is dam and the water is retained within this uh, this uh, small area. OK, and it uh, and it is used for drinking water as a resource, water resource for drinking uh, for drinking purposes. OK, so you can see that there is a two difference. One is inland reservoirs. Inland reservoirs are actually upper piers, lower piers, upper Selita reservoir and Macritchie reservoir are all inland reservoir, natural reservoirs. What does that mean? Now, natural reservoir means actually when there is a heavy rain, the water will naturally go gain entry by from over the surface. Actually, it will flow into the reservoirs. OK, so that is what is called natural inland reservoirs. OK, so the advantage is it is not closer to the sea. It is not in contact with the seawater because it is right inside the island. So therefore it is an inland reservoirs which are relatively having very low dissolved materials in the wa in water. But uh, single PUB went ahead with all the damming of these small, even the smaller uh, estuaries into and converted them into reservoirs. OK, and in addition to that, they also develop the lower Selita. This is known as the lower Selita Reservoir. Formerly it was known as Sungai Selita Reservoir. So that was the last uh, development. In addition to this one, they also uh, uh, developed the Bedok Reservoir. The Bedok Reservoir has a history. OK, yeah, so what they did was they built the dams, OK, in other words, uh, the, the bund, OK, it, uh, most of the bunds are rock field dams, OK, so they, they are all con constructed here and 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 the rainwater is is collected within the reservoir and it is the source for which was well, source from which the water is being treated for drinking purposes. OK, yeah. <clears throat> But uh, Bedok Reservoir is a different story because it is the only reservoir in Singapore which was a man-made reservoir. It is not a natural reservoir, it was man-made. And I will explain to you how this reservoir came into existence. OK, so, so when you are damming, actually when you construct dams and collect this water, there are some certain problems that you may encounter. OK, we will look into that as well. So overall, overall within Singapore, the VUB has constructed altogether 17 reservoirs. OK, you can see that this is the light, the information about the number of reservoirs which have been developed. Sorry. OK. Uh, so these are on the western side which means on this side of it on the on the west side of uh, singapore there are altogether seven reservoirs which have been constructed okay all these are relatively small reservoirs like poen okay jurong lake pandan reservoir all these are very small reservoirs but because of the limitations uh, Singapore facing. Uh, these efforts are at least in, in, in a way uh, uh, 
it uh, it uh, permits you to to uh, permits pub to to collect water for drinking purposes okay so similarly within the in yeah any questions yeah so within the 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 inland reservoirs only four of them are inland reservoirs which is away from the sea you can see upper selita reservoir upper pierce reservoir lower pierce reservoir and macrichi these are all inland reservoirs and at the same time they are also in the eastern side as well they have developed some of them and these are the on the eastern side and and also closer to the straits okay yeah <clears throat> so altogether we have a total of sorry yeah a total of 17 reservoirs including marina barrage and marina reservoir that is the, the final development of natural resources and also to collect rainwater for the purpose of to treat the water for the purpose of drinking. OK, yeah. So when you have a, a reservoir and dam the reservoir in this manner and it is closer to the sea water, you will encounter a problem. OK, some of them I think I can show you. So this is the lower Selita reservoir, okay, and you can see that the th this is a Rockfield Dam, which was constructed in 1982-83, okay, that was the time at which uh, this dam was constructed. Uh, you can see how close it is to the seawater, and if you just take the Popoyan reservoir, that is also you can see the water rainwater collection is on this side. And it is just so close to the seawater on this side. OK, similarly, Serangoon Reservoir is also, you can see it is all at the edge of the uh, seawater. OK, so all these uh, estuarial, uh, estuarial reservoirs, which means estuaries which have been converted into in the form of reservoirs, are uh, closer to the front uh, sea front and there, therefore you, it is quite difficult to prevent salinity intrusion so what is salinity intrusion and it is uh, and also is sometimes uh, it is also subjected to tri tidal influence which means when that high tide more water may try to seep through and go into the and, and enter into the uh, into the reservoir. So that is what is called salinity intrusion. OK, yeah. So how do you prevent that? The <clears throat> what they do is actually they construct the dam, the Rockfield Dam, and in the middle and also they have used the filler material, which is marine sand as well as other filling materials, and they compact it. And then they open up in the middle and then they construct the bentonite slurry cutoff wall. OK, so this bentonite slurry cutoff wall will prevent the possibilities of uh, seawater entering into the into the uh, water which is contained by the, by the reservoir. OK, so you can see that in this case. <coughs> yeah, so you have a. Actually, the 800 millimeter uh, width for the width of the uh, bentonite slurry cutoff wall, and it goes quite deep. It goes right up to about 20 to 30 meters. Okay, so it is it is uh, it is something like a concrete ball, and what does it do? It prevents the saline. In other words, uh, the the sea water creeping inside. In other words, it can seep through and gain entry into the reservoir water. So the water becomes a little bit salty. OK, so these are the problems that you will encounter when you have reservoirs very closer to the sea, sea, sea water. So these, OK, so these are the main main uh, main problems that uh, PUB face. 
because whenever you construct a dam or a rock field dam and segregate the rainwater from sea water, you, you are bound to have a seepage, which means uh, sea water will be will seep through below below the dam and gain entry into this into this water. So in order to to prevent that, we have to use uh, we have to build a bentonite bentonite slurry cutoff wall, which prevents the at, at least it minimizes. You cannot totally totally uh, eliminate the possibility of seepage, but you can improve the condition. In other words, you can limit the possibilities of seawater entering into the into the reservoir water. Okay, so so most of these uh, estuarial dams are are, cons uh, are constructed with. Uh, Bentonite slurry cutoff wall to prevent salinity intrusion. Okay, <clears throat> so what what have we so far learned? One is we have constructed altogether 17 reservoirs, and we have also taken measures to improve and also prevent the possibilities of sea water gaining entry into the into the reservoir and the, that. Uh, is known as activity that uh, the C page is known as sal saline salinity intrusion, which also can be limited by constructing bentonite slurry cutoff wall. Okay. Then the second uh, effort which they took over, uh, they implemented was the design of stormwater collection ponds. Okay, collection ponds. This was initiated in 1983. The, the main purpose is to divert the storm water from storm water drains into the holding ponds and allow in, in impounding of storm water flow in excess of that can be captured and directly pumped into the reservoir, which is actually the uh, Bedok Reservoir. So, <clears throat> yeah. So, how does this work? Now you can see that um, these are the storm water channels, and you can see a, a, a channel where the water is flowing through at the middle. Okay, so what the water that flows through in the middle, uh, a small channel there, right in the middle, is known as a dry weather flow. Why is it known as dry weather flow when there is no rain or no flow of water? Uh, the the water will be collected at the middle channel, which is a small channel, and thereby yeah, the water will st cont uh, small quantities of water will be collected, and it will continue to flow through through this uh, what we call dry weather flow channels. So the in the middle you see a small channel being constructed, and that normally during no rain. You can see that the water will flow through in this way, okay? And this water is highly polluted water. Why do I say that it is highly polluted? Because the because of it takes uh, it it take, it brings in a lot of sands and silt, and it is also other materials which are which are left behind in the in the channel. And thereby, it has high dissolved salts as well as particles. So therefore, the dry weather flow is not should not be diverted because it is it is considered as a relatively uh, polluted water. Okay, so you need to let this uh, water flow and do not uh, divert this one. Okay, yeah. So we have a, a total of 3000 kilometers of large storm water drains. So we can we can divert the water which is flowing through the uh, through the storm water drains into the sea, sea, sea. So therefore. Yeah, you can see that during a rainy season, you will be able to see that uh, sub, uh, substantial amount of water will be flowing through the storm water channel this is an example of this sometimes it can be it can be more turbulent because in case if the rain is very heavy 
we will end up with a storm, with a uh, with a turbulent flow and also the possibilities of flooding okay so but what the truth is that that you will be able to get substantial amount of water diverted and can be utilized for uh, drinking water so this is a scheme which was introduced by pub in the 1983 okay so what they did was they constructed diversion structures okay this is a diversion structure you can see that on at the bottom of the of the uh, the channels okay you have gratings now the gratings is not with in, in, in uh, shown inside the the dry weather flow channel because the dry weather flow channel the water is polluted so we do not normally divert that water so anything more than that okay when there is a heavy rain you will find these gratings will permit the water to flow down and then of course it will be it will be transported through the uh, another channel like this and it will be entering into a holding pond okay so so this is a this is the details of a diversion channel and this diversion channel will divert the water which is due to rain and it will divert it okay by passing through the gratings here you can see that these are gratings for us okay so therefore the water will fall go fall into this and then it can be diverted into the and this is a diversion channel and it will bring the water to the holding pond okay if you look at the cross section these are the gratings and when the water level goes up due to the uh, rainy season and rain during rain you will find that the water will be going through the gratings and then it will divert into the diversion channel in this manner so where can you see this type of uh, ponds okay so you can see that this this is a typical diversion channel you can see that this is the gratings on both sides the water which is flowing through the dry weather flow channel is uh, is not diverted it will permit the water to flow through because the quality of water is uh, is is not adequately good okay so therefore we don't divert the water which is flowing through the dry weather flow channels this water will find its way all the way into the sea okay so when the when during rain the water will water level will increase and you can see that this uh, dry weather flow will be flushed out and then after that the water will gain entry through the gratings and then it will be diverted through the diversion channel okay so yeah, so this is one of those examples okay this all together i think uh, pub has constructed eight ponds okay <clears throat> yeah so this is an example of the holding tank the holding tank is length of 50 meters by 50 meters altogether uh, you can see this type of holding tanks in yishun and also you can see it in bedo bedo area closer to bedo reservoir altogether the pub has constructed eight ponds okay each of those ponds are 5 50 meters by 50 meters in in a square section usually it is in a typically a square section okay <clears throat> and then it has a maximum capacity right up to this point you can see that it is uh, water up to this point can be con collected without any pumping required but if if the rain continues and if the diversion continues to bring in more water this one is the pumping station okay so this pumping station will take the water and pump right into the bedo reservoir okay so you can see that the diversion channel will will bring the water through this sluice gate you can see that there is a sluice gate here and it is through this channel okay the diverted water from the drum uh, storm water drains uh, will be brought into the holding tank this is the holding tank and if there is excess of water within the 
inside the tank, the pump, pump, pump stations are provided with pumps and they will operate and pump the excess water into the Bidok Reservoir. Okay, so this is one of them. Okay, the second method by which they are also diverting the water is by a barrage gate. Okay, so this is a barrage gate. Okay, that is uh, usually under normal circumstances, it will lie flat. In other words, it will, it will not uh, divert the water and it will also be not obstructing the flow. So the flow will continue to flow. Okay, or when only when heavy rain takes place, then you can see that the water level will increase and, and there are sensors which are provided so that, that as soon as the water level increases, the gate will, bring, uh, will be moved upwards, which means it will it will come up to this point and prevent the water from going into the continue to flow and find, find its way into the sea. Instead of that, the water will be diverted through the diversion channel and it will be brought into the into the <clears throat> reservoir. Okay, so you can see that this is the barrage gate which is provided with uh, motorized motorized uh, pistons and also motorized uh, operation. So you can see that this one usually is in the uh, flat position, but it will come into and come in, it will be it can be brought in to block the water and divert the water through the diversion channel so this is a second method how they can divert the water into the diversion channels okay yeah so this is using we call barrage gate okay uh, a metal gate now i have taken some for, for, for so photographs you can see that this is the this is what the gate looks like and uh, and the diversion channel is somewhere here on this side okay so when this comes up like this okay when the barrage gate comes up it will it will prevent the water flowing further down the drain and it will have to find its way so the water will be diverted and this diversion water will be ending up it, at this uh, Pond. This is known as Nishun, Nishun Pond. Okay, now I think uh, currently the, the uh, you can see that the diversion channel is here bringing the water and here also there is a limit. Okay, and if the water continue, continues to flow, So you on mute. Sir, so you mute, you mute, you cannot, you cannot hear what you talk. Yes, but can you repeat please? No, oh, just now you were muted, cannot hear what you say. Oh, okay, okay. But I, I think somebody has muted me. <laughs> okay. Okay. So can I go back to the to the content that I was presenting? Just a minute, please. Okay. So this one is a, again another holding pond. You can see that the diversion structure is really coming up, bringing the water right into the into the re reservoir. And this reservoir, this photograph was taken a long time ago, but now you can see just by the side of KTPH Hospital. KTPH Hospital, you can see this dam. Uh, so, sorry, the retention pond will be there. It is still there, and you will be able to see them. Okay, by the side, of course, you have a hospital being built, which means the KPTH hospital is adjoining this this uh, uh, holding reservoir, okay, uh, holding ponds. So altogether, the PUB has constructed a total of eight ponds, eight of them like this, and also 
the, and also something like this. These are the holding ponds. OK, eight of them have been constructed to divert the water, rainwater, which is flowing through the uh, stormwater drains. OK, stormwater drains and collected in the holding tank, holding, uh, holding um, uh, ponds. And if excess of water will be uh, pumped into the Bedok Reservoir. Now the Bedok Reservoir is not a natural reservoir. OK, you can see that. So how did this come into existence? Uh, the the reason is because the, the this the the location where this uh, reservoir is located in Bedo, they found that the sand which was uh, sandy soil was there, and it, the sandy soil was very good and fav very favorable for land reclamation. So what they did was they started uh, taking the sand away from this uh, this location, and they filled up the. The, for uh, land re reclamation. OK, now currently the ECP, but uh, the ECP uh, highway is located on 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 reclaimed land for which the sand was taken from Bedok Reservoir. OK, so having taken the, uh, the sand away, the land actually belongs to HDB Housing Development Board, and it was earmarked for housing development. But uh, because the sand was taken out, they were unable to put it for any other usage, and they gave this land back to uh, back to PUB, and the PUB converted this land, uh, this area into a reservoir, and that is why the only reservoir which was man-made man -made reservoir in Singapore is this one. Bedok Reservoir is not a natural reservoir. It was created. When was it created? 1983-84. Yeah, at that at that time they were able. So because it is not a natural reservoir, you will find that uh, rainwater will not flow into the into the Bedok Reservoir because it's not natural. So only way by which the water can be retained is from the pumping from all the eight ponds which have been constructed. Uh, along with uh, the development of Bedok Reservoir. OK, <clears throat> so this is uh, the story behind the man-made. Actually, man-made means uh, it is uh, constructed and it is not a natural reservoir. So when there is hay rain, you don't find the water will be flowing into this one because it is not natural and it is not uh, having a catchment. It does not have a catchment. OK, so the water that is retained inside this uh, reservoir is uh, basically the water which is being captured, which means uh, the water which has been accumulated in the ponds, OK, and uh, eight ponds, and then those water which is excess will be pumped into this reservoir, and then from this reservoir, the wa water will be treated in the water treatment plant just by the side of the reservoir. You can see this one. This is one of the treatment plant, bit of treatment plant. And then, of course, you can, uh, yeah, from there you can uh, deliver the water to the consumers. OK, so. So the, the bit of reservoir is part of this is a, it's a part of the. Um, rainwater. Uh, collection system, rainwater collection system, uh, utilizing uh, the ponds, okay, holding ponds, and also pumping the water from the holding ponds into the reservoir itself. Okay, <clears throat> so right, so this is uh, the second scheme. In other words, uh, in the 1960s and 65. Because at that time there was no membrane uh, technology was not available. They had only a few options. One is to augment. In other words, to augment and and uh, make the Indian reservoirs a little more deeper. Uh, OK, and then of course to collect the water. In addition to that, they also made an effort to divert uh, rainwater through which is pass, which is flowing through the rain, uh, stormwater drains and they are diverting this water into the holding ponds 
and from the holding pond, the water is being pumped into Bedok Reservoir. OK, so this is the second uh, major project which was implemented in 1983, OK, to, to, to collect the rainwater. OK, and in addition to that, the recent construction is also what we call the barrage gate at Marina Bay. OK, I'm sure you all know about it and you have been to these places. Uh, OK, and the, and the band and also the retention structures are co constructed on this one. OK, and, and it also faces the same problems, the problems of salinity intrusion. OK, because it is too close to the sea. OK, no matter you have very deep OK uh, construction which will minimize the possibilities of um, say saline or saline water intrusion into the into the marina bay but uh, it can reduce okay so therefore but the problems that you can encounter on this water is the water is uh, is relatively when you compare with the water natural reservoirs and bedok reservoir you will find that this has a higher salinity Okay, so the salt content is a little more because it is too close to the sea and there will be absolutely there will be quick intr 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 intrusion of sal saline water into this marina bay. So what they are trying to do this is to take this water, this water and they want to minimize using the membrane technology. They want to reduce the dissolved content. Dissolved content means uh, the salinity, the salt content on this water, and 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 then of course they will pump this water into the other reservoirs, which means we have altogether 16 other reservoirs. So with, you can pump this water and and permit it to mix with the natural water present in the reservoirs, and then again they can tap the water and and treat the water for drinking purposes. So therefore, the Marina Bay water cannot be directly, uh, directly used. Of course, it can also be treated by membrane RO systems, but uh, currently what they are doing is they are treating this water only for augmenting or additional uh, uh, Additional retention of water for drinking purposes. Okay, so in the long term, then of course they may even construct uh, treatment plants which are capable of treating this water for drinking water. That's possibilities are there. Okay, yeah, yeah. I think you have seen this uh, the structure, the retain retention structure, and you can see the difference in the color. You can see that sea water is a little deep blue in color, and you can see that this Berina Bay is a much, uh, much, uh, much reduced uh, blue color when you compare with the sea water. Okay, but but the water is still uh, high in saline, which means salinity is high on this side. Okay, yeah, right. So these are the two. De developments, okay, which have been conducted, uh, which have been co conducted and constructed by PUB within the last uh, 20 years okay, or 30 years for that matter. <clears throat> and uh, they were able to uh, collect substantial volume of water for drinking purposes and to reduce the dependency of water from Malaysia. So these are the efforts they have taken, the PUB has taken. The, the next effort was focused on uh, limiting the water, less, uh, water losses. That means uh, unaccounted water to less than 7%. Okay, how do they do? Because they are doing, they are using various equipment. Because they are in the PUB, you have one section. One of the sections are only dedicated for limiting, which means to for to identify leakages and also to prevent water leakages. So they are using various equipments. These are the equipments used for that purpose. Listening rod, electronic uh, listening rod, 
geophone. Geophone is something like this. This is a, known as a geophone. Uh, and ground microphone, noise correlators, okay, and also all these are noise correlators which are being used for identifying uh, leakage locations, okay, and rectifying them. They are able to limit the uh, losses, okay, and uh, the losses cannot be brought down to zero. No, that's not possible. But seven percent is uh, quite uh, quite a, a, a great achievement because uh, if you go to any other countries like uh, Philippines, you will see that the amount of uh, water losses amount to about forty percent or forty two percent of the water production. Total production doesn't reach the consumers. So you can see in in Nepal also it is the same. The water. Almost about 40 to 40, uh, yeah, about 30 to 45 uh, percentage of water is lost. Okay, so that is a major uh, losses you will encounter when your distribution system uh, is leaking. So in Singapore, they have brought this down to 7%. Okay, so this is a, 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 a remarkable ach achievement for the PUB. Okay. <clears throat> In addition to limiting the water leakage, they also uh, introduced this mandatory installation of water saving devices, particularly something like uh, thimbles. Okay, thimbles is a small uh, circular uh, a plastic uh, circular unit which has a few holes, so one uh, maybe four or five holes. OK, and that can be connected to the tap and then it can limit the water flow. OK, so thimbles are encouraged because the thimbles can reduce the amount of water flowing through this through the tap. And uh, and in addition to that, you can also use self closing delayed action tap, which is actually this one, which is sometimes known as the pressure tap. OK, so when you push it, the water will be coming and naturally after some time it it closes itself automatically. OK, so usually uh, within 15 seconds uh, you can see the tap will re close itself. So these are mandatory. Mandatory means actually there is. Uh, uh, the, 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 the you have to enter. You have to install in certain uh, buildings. So it is a mandatory installation of water saving devices. Okay, <clears throat> then the, the flushing systems also are limited. Now the flushing systems cannot have systems more than 4.5 liters WCs. Okay, so this, these are all mandatory requirement, which means whenever buildings undergo repair uh, and uh, or redevelopment, now you cannot have a water closet which we used to use about nine liters of water. Now it has been brought down to 4.5 liters. So you can see that almost they have half the quantity of water being used for flushing. Similarly for urinals, there is a limit. The urinals are can only discharge 1.5 liters per urinal. OK, so there thereby these are some of the measures to taken by PUB and, and the government to limit the water usage and also to reduce the consumption of water. OK. Yeah. <laughs> so just to recapitulate. <clears throat> OK, so we have gone through the, the main source of water is actually the reservoirs. So in Singapore, we have a total of 17 reservoirs. That was the two. And also we have augment, uh, constructed buns and also retained wa water within the ponds itself. So altogether, we have 17 reservoirs, OK, which are holding water for from rainwater and those can be utilized for drinking water per, for for treatment of for drinking water. Uh, then I, I have also highlighted 
and explain to you how uh, yeah <clears throat> how uh, rainwater can be diverted and it can be it can be collected okay so the 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 project which diverted the water from stormwater drains and also uh, storing it in res uh, man made reservoirs you can see that is one of the projects were uh, implemented by pub to 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 collect water okay so now i think uh, just um, one more uh, info I, I think i need to give you some time for breakfast at what time is your breakfast anyone uh, uh currently no no oh okay so now breakfast is yeah yeah can i can i give you a break now okay yeah, i'll give you a break now okay okay thank you yeah. what time is the class ending today uh, sir uh -huh. what time is the class ending uh, sir uh we will be ending at 9:30 wow so late uh, for first day uh. yeah <laughs> Okay. Uh, maybe, maybe, uh, we'll uh, <laughs> we'll see if I can cover things uh, within time. Of course, you can leave early, lah. Okay. 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 Can. Thank you. Thanks.
So can we continue now? <clears throat> okay, so again. Okay. <clears throat> the first uh, re reclamation. Actually, the previous efforts are all to in order to reduce the water consumption was was the main aim, and at the same time collecting as much of. Uh, Water, rainwater, as well as um, within the reservoirs, were the initial efforts. Okay, but reclaim reclamation, which means wastewater being reclaimed and utilized as a non-potable use, started in 1966. Okay, how did that start? <clears throat> the they they constructed a, a treatment plant, conventional treatment plant. OK, and uh, they take the wastewater from Ulupandan treatment plant. They take the water, wastewater, which means actually after treatment, <clears throat> the water will be discharged right into the sea. In this case, what they took was the water that was treated. <coughs> the, the, the water which was treated by Ulupandan treatment plant, they diverted this water, they pump the water to another treatment plant, which was known as industrial waterworks. OK, the amount of water which was treated was 45,000 meter cube of water per, per day. So what they did was they take the treated water from Ulupandan water reclamation plant, and then they retreat the water by conventional means. OK, so <clears throat> yeah, so the the F, actually, the effluent of water from the reclamation plant, which was meeting the international standard, which is 20 milligram per POD and 30 milligram per liter total suspended solids. So, sorry, to, total uh, sus suspended solids. OK, so these are the two criteria for the wastewater, which is uh, which which is the effluent. In other words, the treated water from Ulupandan treatment plant, they take this water and convert them into industrial water. How did they do that? Now this is the complex, okay? So the Ulupandan, uh, the treatment reclamation water plant, and these are all aerators and, and sedimentation, sedimentation tanks, and you can see the digesters are here. Okay, so this is actually the uh, bird's eye view of uh, the Ulupandan treatment plant. And uh, this water is brought in, okay, and then it is treated by, it is treated by <clears throat> conventional treatment, which means actually to removing the, the uh, grid particles using uh, what we call the, the, the fine screen. And after that, they, they dose with uh, hypochlorous acid and alum and polymer because alum and polymer is coagulants. Both are coagulants. OK, in addition to that, you also adjust the pH OK, using hypochlorite dosing, sodium hypochlorite. And then, of course, once the mix, mixing mixer of all the, the chemicals as well as the hypochlorite dosing, then they permit it to pass through the sedimentation tank 
Okay, so the sedimentation tank will bring up, actually settle down all the particles because all them all of them are are treated by alum and polymer. So therefore, it can be quickly river. I mean, collected and it can be taken out as sludge. The 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 overflow, which means actually the amount of water which uh, which is bringing in, will also be ex exiting the the clarifier. And this water will pass through the sand filter. And after going all these process, then they conduct the aeration. Okay, aeration of the uh, of the uh, industrial water plant. And after aerating, then of course they put it into a what is called a holding tank again, and then they pump it into the uh, into the distribution service reservoirs, which are located in Jurong Island. Okay, so this one, this water, which is taken from Ulupangan treatment plant, and it passes through these series of treatment units. Okay, is for industrial use. In other words, it can only be used for washing, uh, washing, and and. Uh, uh, you can see that it, uh, recreation, which means actually plant, uh, if you want to water the plants, it can be used for fire protection system, okay, but it cannot be used for drinking purposes. Okay, so this is the first effort which took place into converting wastewater into, into industrial water, and this industrial water is essentially supplied to all the companies okay and uh, and how are they persuading the companies to buy this is because this is one of the cheapest this is much lower in price when you compare with drinking water okay so that is an incentive for the people to switch from using in drinking water in the industrial sector into accommodating reclaimed water okay so why we are not using it for Drinking is because you can see that uh, the the treated water at the end of the treatment, if you look at the the various parameters, you have a high content of uh, ammonia. Ammonia will be there because it is part of uh, part of the wastewater. Okay, so it should be yeah. Usually, you will find ammonia. You get the total for, uh, solids will be in the range of about 350 to 1,300 milligram per liter, very high concentration. Then hardness, the water. In addition to that, it is also tend to be hard because because it has more positive ions, okay, and, and cations, okay. So therefore, particularly from calcium, magnesium, that will elevate the temp, elevate the concentration of hardness okay so the it is a hard water it contains more solids it contains ammonia okay so because of these reasons it cannot be converted into uh, drinking water so it is only meant for in uh, industrial water industrial use okay <clears throat> so having developed uh, this uh, it, uh, they actually by uh, treating the Ulupandan wastewater treatment uh, water from Ulupandan treatment plant, PUB also tried to to replace wash to systems flushing. Okay, systems flushing by uh, by this uh, industrial water. So what they did was they picked out a, a housing estate. Okay, housing estate, and then of course they they were able to supply the water completely separately from drinking water because this is an industrial water that means it has contaminants, okay, which are not removed, and this water is only meant for use for industrial use. So, <clears throat> so they wanted to also provide this water for WC flushing. Okay, so they picked out a. Sorry. Just a minute, please.
So wait on. Just a minute, please. I want to check. Okay. Okay. So, so basically, I think, uh, yeah. But I was. Uh, yeah. So. <clears throat> The, the reason because of the contaminants, it is not the, the industrial water is not meant for drinking purposes. So this was the first initiative to use reclaim and use <coughs> treat. I mean, uh, base water into uh, industrial use. OK, non portable use. OK, and this particular water can only be used for industrial water flushing and uh, of course, they try to supply this water for to the uh, to the flats. OK, for, uh, there was one estate which is known as uh, Pandan. Pandan, uh, Pandan uh, I think uh, in, in uh, housing, uh, which was developed by JTC. OK, so what they did was they supplied this water for WC flushing. But the consumers were complaining about order, sediment collection, various, and also they said that appreciation of the property value is inhibited because of this water. And the PUB, after about a few years of uh, permitting them to use this for flushing purposes, withdrew. In other words, we dis dismantled the whole, whole entire pipe work because it was uh, there were a lot of complaints from public. OK, so that was the reason why industrial water, which was supplied for how Teban Garden housing, OK, Teban Garden uh, was withdrawn because of these reasons. OK, <clears throat> yeah. Then, of course, uh, the, the new development, of course, it's a is a very detailed uh, area, but I'm just telling you that it basically the new water plants are now replacing. OK, in time to come, I think in the future there is likelihood of uh, uh, industrial water being completely taken away. The plant plant will be taken away and there may be a replacement in the form of new water plant. OK, so I'm not going to uh, to describe the treatment process in new water plant, which of course we will go through separately uh, on, on later date. OK. Yeah, so the, so basically the uh, the water resources that we are we are uh, really committed to is coming from various sources. The, OK, local catchment, which means the water which is retained in the uh, reservoirs, inland reservoir as well as estuarial dams uh, is the first, uh, the main source of water supply for Singapore, okay, because it is all not dependent on any other countries, okay. Then, of course, the second source is actually imported water, which is Malaysia. Uh, essentially, the supply of water from Malaysian uh, reservoirs to Singapore is uh, the part which we call it as imported water. The recycled water is uh, is two. In other words, uh, currently we have two. One is industrial water. At the same time, we also are producing new water. So these two are combined together 
provides the recycling water as another additional tap. Okay, <clears throat> in addition to all these, there is also effort, there are also desalination plants which have been constructed and operating, which takes water from the sea and converts it into drinking water. So these are the four main taps, okay, which uh, they call it as the four, four, uh, four main taps concept for, for water independence. In the, in, in the future, it will actually, the replaced water will take almost 50%. And desalinated water will undertake about 30% of the water production for drinking purposes. Okay, imported water will be in the form of 20%. Okay, not in independent. I think it can it can also so increase the take or take from uh, local catchments and local. This thing will contribute 20% of the. Uh, local water source. Okay, so the dependency on imported source will diminish as we go, uh, go along. And these four taps are the main main thrust of the PUB to, pre to uh, preserve and, and also to, to treat the water for, for the two uses. One is portable use and at the same time, for industrial. Desalinated water can be used for drinking purposes. Recycled water will, will be supplied to industrial complexes and it will reduce the dependence. In other words, it will re reduce the pressure on, uh, on local water production, which means actually for drinking water purposes. Okay, and desalinated water can augment and, and also it will be a stable supply of water from these four taps. Any any questions on this so far? I've just gone through the the his, short history of what uh, those water resources development in Singapore. Any questions so far? Okay, <clears throat> now. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> now what we are going to do is actually going into the details of, uh, of uh, water treat conventional water treatment in, Sing in Singapore. Okay, yeah. let me just take the... Right. Okay. Now, <clears throat> right. <clears throat> Are you able to see the slides now? Okay. <clears throat> Basically, water treatment. I think all the plants, okay, supplying water for drinking purposes are all, we call it as conventional treatment plants. Okay, the conventional treatment plant only does two activities. One, it can, it is only capable of removing particles in water, and it can also use disinfectant to, to, to eliminate microorganisms in water and also make it more safer for drinking purposes. 
Okay, so so what if you take a sample of water? Okay, if you take a sample of water from inland res reservoir, maybe if you take a sample of water from Macritchie, what are the what are the common pollutants which will be in that sa sample? Okay, you will have grit particles. Grit particles are particles which are small, uh, like uh, pebbles. Okay, and glass glass pieces, small broken glass pieces. All those are co considered as the grit particle. Then you will find uh, uh, suspended solids in water. If you take the sample and just see, you will be able to see some some uh, suspension moving around. In other words, floating or it can be moving around. Those are known as suspended solids. Colloidal solids will are uh, much tiny particles which will be there. It cannot be seen by naked eye because colloidal solids are too, so tiny that it cannot be seen by the naked eye, but it will impart a color. In other words, it will give a light yellow color of the water. Okay, <clears throat> so those are known as colloidal particles. In addition to colloidal particles, you will have a, a, a bacteria, virus, and worms. Okay, this will be also present in water, natural water, and very often you will, you will have a, a algae population which will also be in in the water source. In addition to this, you may have a floating debris, which is the papers and plastic plastic bottles will be also floating in the natural reservoir. These are all the common impurities which the raw water carries. OK, so <clears throat> yeah, so conventional treatment does only two things. It is it can remove all particles. In other words, whichever whether it is a large particle or small particle, they can uh, totally the conventional treatment can remove particle almost to 99.99%. OK, and then having removed the particles, what do they do? They in disinfect using chlorine or ozone or any other powerful, uh, uh, powerful uh, chemicals which can kill the bacteria. OK, so bacteria, viruses and also the worms has to be eliminated and that is by disinfection. So conventional treatment only does two things. One is removal of particle. And at the same and after removing the particles in various stages, you the water is disinfected, which means it is uh, the bacterial populations will be killed and and uh, and the water will be made safe for human consumption. OK, so the important factor that that you have to take, take note is that conventional treatment can uh, remove particles, but uh, but it will not be able to remove dissolved contaminants. If there is something which you have already dissolved in water and it is in the ionic form, conventional treatment cannot remove them. OK, so this is a limitation. Conventional treatment where you are using uh, flocculation, coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation, filtration and disinfection. These are the five main components of a conventional treatment. And what is it achievable is basically it can remove particles in the water and disinfect the water using one of the one of the five uh, chemicals that can that uh, can kill the bacteria. OK, so basically only two stages. One is removal of particles, disinfection, and that is what we call conventional treatment. The conventional treatment is incapable of removing dissolved salts. So because of this uh, restriction uh, limitation, because the conventional treatment cannot remove dissolved so solids or dissolved chemical dissolved salts in water, we need we cannot take a water which contains high content of uh, dissolved salts. In other words, if it has a uh, high content of dissolved salts, then of course we don't take that resource okay for the treatment purposes. Why? Because the conventional treatment has, cannot remove, cannot treat, okay, <clears throat> cannot treat 
uh, dissolve salts. So the limitation of conventional treatment is that it cannot remove dissolved impurities in raw water. Okay, so just take note of this one because uh, your in your in your common test, I, I may give you uh, MCQ questions as well. So when I give you these MCQ questions, these are quite important uh, to know that uh, that uh, you will be able to pick the right answer. The answer is actually conventional treatment cannot remove dissolved salts, cannot remove dissolved salts. It can only remove particles and also it can disinfect water. And those are the two activities which are conducted in conventional treatment. So in, if you want to conduct a, a conventional treatment, your water has to be has to be having no dissolved salts or minimum dissolved salts. OK, so it should either have very little sol solid because you cannot get water absolutely without any dissolved impurities. It is not possible, but you can you can take water which is from mainly from rainwater source collection ponds and reservoirs and these water will contain less dissolved salts and it is easier for the for the authorities so that they can treat the water with convenience okay so basically conventional treatment has two stages removal of particles removal uh, disinfecting and 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 killing or killing the bacteria okay eliminating the bacteria viruses and microorganisms and these are the main two activities of conventional treatment so we have to source for the water that has no dissolved salts and this is where our our request from malaysia because malaysia has uh, imported reservoirs and also river sources from which the water can be delivered to Singapore. Okay, so, and this water does not have from, from reservoir sources at, at the same time, if it is going to be taken from rainwater collection impounded in reservoirs, all those sources are quite very much less in dissolved salts. Okay, so the prerequisite, if you want to conduct a conventional treatment, your source of water should not have too much dissolved solids. OK, very clear. Yeah, so how is the treatment is conducted in the conventional treatment plant? I think uh, my approach is to rep, uh, reflect the, uh, the limitations and also the de details in a single line diagram. I call this a single line diagram. OK, yeah. and. And on the single line diagram, you mark away the sizes, okay? 100 micrometers in diameter particles and 20 micrometers diameter particles. So this one, okay, Y20, the colloidal solids uh, when uh, normally is within less than 20 micrometers in diameter. Okay, so when, the, when, the, when you are taking the samples and if you take away the grid particles and suspended solids, you will find that remaining content will be the colloidal solids. So to start off with the treatment plan, the first thing that you need to remove from the raw water is grid particles. Why? Because grid particles are heavy and it is quickly, it will get, uh, it will settle down. And if you permit these grid particles to travel across the water treatment plan, you will find a lot of accumulation of grid particles in the pipeline. OK, so therefore, in order to prevent, the first activity is actually to remove grid particles before you go on to the second stage. The first stage is all those the, the particles which are greater than 100 micrometers in size are, are taken as grid particles. And these grid particles are heavy and it can be easily removed. Then from 20 micrometers to 100 micrometers, you, the, the particle sizes are classified as suspended solids. Suspended solids. Okay, why we call it as suspended solids is because it, when you look at the sample and if you are able to see a 
a particle moving around. We are able to see a particle which is moving around. Then that particle which is able, which your eye is able to see is considered as suspended solids. OK, so suspended solids can be removed in sedimentation tank. OK, sedimentation tank, it uses the gravitational force to remove the suspended solids. So this is also a relatively easier way to treat the water. But the moment you come below, which means 20 micrometer size particles, now these particles are considered as colloidal solids, and these solids are not visible to the naked eye. So that means when you take the sample, okay, if the if the sample only contains colloidal solids, it will not be, it cannot be, you can't see the particle. Particle cannot be seen, but it develops a color, a, a yellow color or a faint yellow color, and that is due to colloidal particles. OK, to remove the colloidal particles, you need to go do flo coagulation, flocculation and secondary sedimentation. OK, I'll tell you for the reasons why. OK, so it is easier for you to reflect OK, but through this uh, single line diagram. So I'm re-emphasizing that any particles in the water which is more than 100 micrometers in size are classified as uh, grid particles and grid particles can be removed in grid channels or any other units which are capable of removing grid, grid particles. But between 20 micrometers and 100 micrometers, the, the sizes of the, because if the larger particle, the suspended solids are visible, which means you can see them. You can see them with naked eye OK, if you are able to see that that particular uh, particle is called suspended solids. Now, suspended solids will be able to be removed in a settleable in, in a tank, which means a sedimentation tank. But for suspended solids to be removed, your retention time, which means your detention time within the, uh, the tank, OK, which means uh, in, in the clarifier, or sedimentation tank will take at least two to three hours for the suspended solids to, to settle and, and be removed. OK, so removing grid particle is not a problem. Removing suspended solids is also not a problem because it can be retained in a, in a sedimentation tank, large sedimentation tank. And if you permit the water to retain for to be retained for two to three hours, the suspended solids can be removed. Colloidal solids are quite difficult to remove because you can see that the great part, uh, colloidal particles are normally negatively charged particles. OK. Let me see. Uh, yeah. So if you want to remove colloidal solids, you have to pass through these four stages, which means colloidal particles can be removed you need to have a chemical introduced, okay? So that means uh, you either you have to introduce aluminum sulfate or aluminum ferric chloride, ferric sulfate. These are coagulants which will be able to neutralize the colloidal particles. After that, you need to flocculate. Flocculate means actually uh, have a pedal and rotate it very slowly, extremely slowly and, and and make sure that the particles get clustered together and form a bigger and bigger particles which can be easily removed in the secondary sedimentation tank. OK, colloidal particles, if you want to remove, you have to go through these three stages. OK, grid particle, no, no problem. Suspended solids, sedimentation tank. Colloidal particles, you have to have rapid mixing, flocculation, secondary sedimentation. OK, so therefore you can see that the removal of solid uh, colloidal particles are the major problem in the treatment plant. Yeah. Right. So what do we do for the grid particle removal? Now this is a grid channel. You can see that this is a long channel and by limiting the, 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 the velocity of water, through the channel to 0.3 meter per second. That means your 
we are maintaining a flow rate of uh, the velocity of 0.3 meters per second. And that is good enough for you to remove grid particles. Uh, we will be able to do some calculations and I will show you how, how uh, a long uh, <coughs> grid channel can be utilized to, to collect the grid particles and remove them. Okay, so raw water flows through the bar screens. Bar screens are the, to remove the larger particles and it can remove floating debris, leaves, branches, floating papers, all these can be removed in the, in the, <clears throat> in the screen, bar screen. And then when it passes through the grid particles, raw water flows through the grid channel where the velocity of water is reduced to less than 0.3 meter per second. And if you drop these velocities so low, within 0.3 meter per second, you will be able to remove the, uh, the suspended solids, okay? <clears throat> yeah. So grid particles can be removed and then and that after removing the grid particles, you place the water inside the primary sedimentation tank. We call this primary sedimentation tank. Why do I call it primary? This is the first tank into which your water will be there and natural sedimentation will take place. And the main component which can remove colloid, sorry, uh, suspended solids is this unit. The, primary sedimentation. Okay, so you are con conducting the primary sedimentation essentially to remove, remove suspended solids. Grid, of course, can be removed in grid channels. So grid particle can be removed. Uh, colloidal particles uh, will, uh, sorry, uh, the discrete particles, suspended solids can be removed in the primary sedimentation tank. And then in order to remove the colloidal particles, you have to go through three stages. What happens is that you need to retain the water inside a rapid mix chamber, and you need to introduce chemicals like aluminum sulfate or coagulants and rap rapidly mix it. In other words, it, there might be a substan substantial turbulence which has to be created by the motors and also the impellers. We call these impellers, okay? So the impellers will rotate at extremely high speed and then it will disperse the co coagulant equally into the water retained within the tank. Okay, having, <clears throat> having uh, mixed with the coagulant, okay, you transfer the water into flocculation tanks. So, okay, so the second area, you can see this is a paddle. Both paddles are being slowly operating. And when they operate at slow speed, you know, the particles are clustered together and a larger flock formation will take place. And once the flock is uh, appearing on the water, you transfer the water into the sedimentation tank and we call it secondary sedimentation. Okay. Now, so therefore, if I ask you this question, how do you remove colloidal particles? The characteristics of colloidal particles are the particles are less than 20 micrometers in diameter size. The particles are negatively charged. Okay. And then, of course, you have to introduce a coagulant, which is either aluminum sulfate, ferric sulfate, or ferric chloride, or it can be any other alternative coagulant, but you need to coagulate and then you need to flocculate, okay? So the, you, subsequent to rapid mixing, then you transfer the water into flocculation tank and slow mix the, provide, uh, the, the, the water. Slowly you can mix it and make the flock formation visible and also cluster, cluster together. And when the particles grow in that size, then it is easier for you to remove in the secondary sedimentation tank. Okay, so that means if I ask this question, particularly this question when I ask, how do you remove colloidal particles? Colloidal particles can be removed by coagulation, flocculation, and there's a secondary sedimentation. Very clear? Yeah. Now, why do we need to do that? Is because 
you, we use when you examine the colloidal particles under microscope, you will be able to see that most of the colloidal particles which are have diameters less than 20 micrometers in size are normally negatively charged. OK, so when a negatively charged particle encounters another negatively charged particles, the repulsion will be there. OK, so the colloidal particles cannot be removed by putting it into a sedimentation tank. Why? The reason is because it it will repel each other, OK, because of the negatively charged surface. So what the first activity that you have to do is to neutralize these charges. Without neutralizing these charges, it is difficult for you to destabilize and collect these colloidal solids. OK, so. <clears throat> so the rapid mix unit essentially remove uh, neutralizes this negatively charged. OK, negative charge on the surface can be removed OK by the coagulant which you introduce into the rapid mix unit. That is the first unit. OK, once it is destabilized. OK, so, sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> then of course you can grow the particle, which means actually by flocculation you grow the particles and then you can pass it into the sedimentation tank to remove it. OK, so colloidal solids, if you are going to remove from water, the first thing that you need to do is neutralize the negative charges on the colloidal particle, aggregate the destabilized particle by slow mixing, which is flocculation, and remove the aggregated solid particle by the secondary sedimentation. OK, so you need to use the word secondary sedimentation. Why? <coughs> because we are having two tank, uh, sedimentation tank. One is actually the primary sedimentation tank. And then, of course, for removing colloidal particles, we have to con have another se uh, sedimentation tank, and that is known as secondary sedimentation. OK, yeah. So having removed the uh, the colloidal particles by coagulation, flocculation, and sedimentation, you will be able to remove 90%. Okay, 90% of the colloidal solids. 90% of the colloidal solids can be removed by combination of coagulation, flocculation, and secondary sedimentation. But what happens is you can remove 90%, but 10% will still remain. So when, yeah, so. With 10% uh, of colloidal solids remaining, can PUD supply the water to the consumers? No. Why? Because even if it is a 10% uh, of colloidal solids present in the water, it really generates a extremely mild yellow color. Okay, you, not no matter because it is only a 10% of the uh, colloidal solids which are refusing to to be removed in the three process and that 10 percent will impart color and when you pump this water to the consumers the consumers are going to complain why because the the public always associate pollution in water by by looking at the color of the water okay this is a psychological uh, approach. Now, normally when you give uh, two samples, one crystal clear water and another one with a slight coloration, and if you ask them which one would you like to, uh, to drink, they will always pinpoint to the crystal clear water. OK, so this 10 percent also has to be removed. OK, so in order to remove this 10 percent of what I call it rebellious particles, which means it is not willing to be settled by these three process, uh, uh, rapid mixing, flocculation, and sedimentation, secondary sedimentation. This 10% will also have to be removed. So how do you remove them? You pass it through the filtration, sand filters. OK, so you keep the sand filters, and then you bring the water into, this, uh, into the filtration unit. And when the water percolates through the sand media, 
okay and it can be collected through the under under drain system because these are the nozzles filter nozzles and the water will find its way through the nozzles into this lower <coughs> under uh, 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 under actually holding the the okay <coughs> To actually, the water will percolate through the sedimentation tank and gain entry through the nozzles. Nozzles are provided with open, small open spaces. So the water will be able to percolate through and the particles will be trapped in the sand media. The water will finally pass through, this, through, the, through the nozzles. Okay, these are known as filter nozzles. And then, of course, you can collect this water separately. And this water will be absolutely crystal clear. Are you all with me? Right. <clears throat> so, so this is what you do for the 10% of the colloidal solids. 90% can be removed in the secondary sedimentation tank, which means after coagulation, flocculation, and secondary sedimentation, 90% of the uh, suspended solid, sorry, uh, colloidal solids can be removed. <laughs> Then for the 10%, you still need to use filtration, sand filtration. And once you have the particles are trapped here, <coughs> yeah, you have to backwash the filter. <coughs> we, will, <coughs> we, will, we will go through this in detail when we go through filtration process, but uh, for the moment, you can just take note that the particles, the 10% of the colloidal solids will be trapped in there sand media and only water will be flowing through in through the nozzles okay filter nozzles and also leave all the particles colloidal particles trapped inside the sand media so over a period of time it, it your filter will get clogged okay so therefore you need to backwash which means you need to clean up this uh, filtration unit and we will go through those the procedures how to uh, to uh, to establish uh, okay and remove the particles which are trapped inside the sand media and again to put the filtration function in in order you have to backwash but the details of backwash process we will be going through under filter filtration at the later stage okay <coughs> having having uh, Passing, pa having passed through the filtration process, your water becomes crystal clear, but the magnitude of, of uh, the, the microorganisms which, are, which will be there has to be removed, which means it has to be killed. Okay, so what, we, what are the chemicals we use for eliminating, eliminating the microorganisms in the, present in the water? We can only use chlorine because chlorine has been used for a, more than 100 years. And chlorine is also a very powerful oxidizing agent. In addition to that, it, can, it has a very high potential to kill the bacteria. The ozone is also equally good. <coughs> ozone, the problem is it has, to be, it has to be manufactured. In other words, you have to produce ozone at the treatment plant and use them for killing the bacteria. Okay, so these are the common, these are the common disinfecting agents which are used for, to eliminate the bacterial bacterial presence in water. Okay, so chlorine, ozone, chlorine dioxide, chloramines, and ultraviolet radiation is used to disinfect. But you need to take note of this last uh, ultraviolet radiation. The ultraviolet radiation does not kill the bacteria, but it what it does is it uh, it uh, sterilizes the bacteria. So there is a two uh, difference between the disinfection and also sterilization. I will explain them under disinfection uh, chapter. Okay, so for the moment, you can use any one of them. Okay, chlorine or ozone or chlorine dioxide or chloramines. So, so that, that your water is well protected. Okay, and and uh, it is uh, with chlorine. Chlorine, the presence of chlorine, you, the water is more safer because until the water reaches the do, to the utility, I mean utility tap, which means the 
common uh, populations uh, taps okay your water is well preserved because of the presence of chlorine okay chlorine is a residual protection we call it residual protection okay so chlorine pl plays a very important role on the disinfection process similarly ozone is also used for killing bacteria uh, relatively a low concentration of ozone can achieve the same amount of impact uh, which uh, chlorine has. So this is also a very highly potential oxidizing agent as well as a disinfecting agent. Chlorine dioxide is, 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 uh, is equally good okay, in killing bacteria. Chloramines is only a con conversion of re remaining chlorine and then you inject ammonia and you convert it into chloramines. Why do you want to do that? We will discuss this later. Okay. And finally, we go through the, what is called the ultraviolet radiation. Ultraviolet radiation will sterilize the microorganism. It will not be killing the bacteria, bacteria but it can sterilize and make sure that it does not multiply. Okay. So treated water finally retained in the clear water storage. That is at the bottom of the treatment plant. Normally you have a, a tank which will, which will, uh, which will be uh, injected with uh, chlorine, which means uh, having introduced chlorine, this water will have to go into the tank and it will be retained for a certain period of time and they will take samples and test in the laboratory, okay? And if the if the quality is okay, then they will be able to pump the water to the distribution system, okay? Yeah, so treated water is finally retained in the clear water storage tank before the water is pumped into the distribution. Why? They want to make sure that the bacterial populations are all eliminated. So having injected with chlorine, ozone, or chlorine dioxide, any one of them, the water will be retained for a certain time, period of time, okay, providing adequate contact time for the bacteria, for the, for the chemical, which means uh, chlorine or ozone to disinfect and, and eliminate the microorganisms, okay? So in order to do that, they retain the water in the clear water well, and they take samples from there, test for the quality and bacterial presence. And then in addition to that, they can, if they are satisfied with the results, then of course the water can be pumped into the distribution system. Okay, so if, if I ask you how uh, to explain conventional treatment, I think this diagram is it, it, it will be useful in that form because it is really it is taking to account all the processes that occur in the treatment plant. Okay, yeah, you can see the larger particles will be taken out from the bar screen, grid particles in grid removal channels. Then after that, you put the the water into a sedimentation tank essentially to remove the suspended solids. Then having removed the suspended solids, what remains is colloidal solids. So colloidal solids will have to be submitted to the, to be brought into the rapid mix tank and you add chemical coagulants. And once you have destabilized the particles, then of course you transfer it into the flocculation tank and mix slowly mix the water so that for almost 30 minutes. Okay, so having developed the su sufficient size of the flocks, it can be transferred into the secondary sedimentation tank. Okay, in the secondary sedimentation tank, you can find all the colloidal particles which have been settled. It can be removed. And then the effluent from the secondary sedimentation tank, which contains 10% of the colloidal solids, it is passed through the filter media. <coughs> okay, once you have passed through the filter media, sorry. Okay. Right. Once you have passed through the filter media, 
virtually you, your water has has to go through one more step. That is uh, disinfection. Sorry. OK, so having passed through the filter, then you dose with the disinfectant, OK, and then place it inside the tank. This tank is usually provided in most of the treatment plants as an underground tank. And once you have taken the samples and tested for the quality, then you can pump the water to the distribution system. <laughs> OK, so this uh, will give you a. This drawing is quite important because certainly there will be one question on this. OK, for your common test. OK, so please take note of this uh, schematic diagram to explain conventional treatment. Any questions up to this point? Any questions? 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 No, no, sir. Yeah. OK. OK, so what I'm going to do now. OK, so we have gone through two areas today. One is the water resources. OK, what are the water resources and alternative uh, uh, methods to recycle water and use the water as for non -port -port portable use? OK, so we have gone through the in detail. We have also looked into conventional treatment. OK, conventional treatment is to. <clears throat> is to remove all the particles and disinfect the water and and pump it to the consumers. That is what the conventional treatment does. Removal of particles. So what kind of particles are there? Grid particles, suspended solids and colloidal solids. Grid particles can be removed in grid channels, OK? And then your suspended solids can be removed in the second for primary sedimentation. Then it passed through three units, which is rapid mix, flocculation, and sediment, secondary sedimentation to remove colloidal particles. And up to the, about 90% can be removed by the combination of three unit processes. But the 10% will remain, and that 10% of colloidal particles can be removed in the filters, sand filters. And after removing the remaining 10% of the colloidal solids, you have to inject with chlorine or any other uh, disinfecting agent, kill the bacteria, and then place the water under observation for in the clear water reservoir, which is clear, clear water tank at the bottom of the, the treatment plant. And having taken samples of this and tested for the quality, if the quality is OK, then of course the water will be pumped to the consumers. OK, so this diagram is quite important. OK, oh, let me just go through. So what I'll do is I'm going to I'm going to send you. OK, wait. OK. OK. <clears throat> Are you able to see this? Uh, see the slide now? Are you able to see there? No, yes. sir. Can I see anything, sir? Huh? Can I see anything? Can, you cannot see uh, everything. Thing, is it? It's just your diagram, the, the whole chart. Ah, OK, this now are you able to see it very clearly now? Uh, no, sir, students. Oh. It's still the convention water treatment process. Oh, OK. <clears throat> right. Wait, I'll let, just a minute, please. Huh?
Now, are you able to see that? Yes, sir. OK. Thank you, sir. Now, now these are some of the past paper questions. OK, so I'm just highlighting what you need to know. In this particular question, with the aid of a schematic diagram, OK, I can see that I have magnified it. With an aid of a schematic diagram, explain the conventional water treatment process and highlight its advantages and limitations. OK, so this is a typical questions for your common test. OK, yeah. And if you are going to answer this question, you need to know this. Uh, this process, which means this is the, the, the diagram. It, uh, it is the sequencer that uh, processes that are adapted by the treatment plant. OK, where you can one by one, you can remove the materials. OK, so suspended solids and solid particles, and then we only disinfect and then pass the water to the consumers. OK, so you can draw this diagram. OK. And only thing is that I have not explained is those sludge which is collected here in the primary sedimentation and also secondary sedimentation and backflash or backwash water from the from these filters. All these three will be collected into a sludge thickening tank. OK, because they are all concentrated solid particles and it is rejected by it should be taken out from the sedimentation tank. So this amount of particles as well as this amount of colloidal particles which have settled down, all those will be pumped into the sludge thickening unit. OK, and where it will be converted into cakes, which means they will actually use what is called a filter press. And the filter press will squeeze the water out and convert this into solid particles and they can be disposed in the landfill. OK, so this this uh, diagram which uh, gives you gives you the details, but I have now explained what these arrows indicate. Arrows are indicating the collection of the solid materials which are for in the form of sludge and also backwash water. OK, so just take note of that. OK, and then you can also explain. OK, the explanations are given here. The conventional treatment in includes the following unit process. Bar screen for the removal of larger particles. What are the type of larger particles you have? Leaves, branches, uh, bottles, which is actually the bottles, uh, plastic bottles, and any other things which uh, can, which uh, floats on the water. Okay, so bar screen removes all the larger particles. Grid channel removes removal of grid particles. What are grid particles? Grid particles are having diameter more than 100 micrometer in diameter size are considered as grid particles. So they can be removed in grid channels or any other equivalent unit uh, units uh, can remove the grid, grid particles. So grid particles have to be removed first because it must be a priority for, for removing of uh, the grid particles because it can settle down in the pipelines and obstruct the, the whole process. So therefore, grid particles will have to be removed as a priority and it, it should be removed first. And once you have removed the grid particles, after that you will be able to bring place the water in a primary sedimentation tank for about three hours or two hours, and that will be able to remove suspended solids. So what is suspended solids? Solids which can be visible, which are able to, your eye, eye can, your eyes can be able to see the movement of the solid, solid particles which are suspended in the water. And when they are moving across, they are considered as suspended solids. OK, the suspended solids can be removed by sedimentation. OK, you need to put it into a large sedimentation tank and leave it for about two to three hours. You will find all the materials with all the suspended solids will be settled down and that although it takes about two or three hours. 
the suspended solids can be removed. There is no difficulty in removing suspended solids. But the problem comes in, in for the colloidal particles. If you want to remove the colloidal particles, you need to go through these three stages. Rapid mixing with coagulants, flocculating with slow speed moving pedals, and the secondary sedimentation to, to collect the destabilized flocculated particles. OK, so these three are required for you to remove colloidal suspensions. Then what happened? What does the filter do? Filter do is to to remove any remaining colloidal suspension. And and in the single line diagram, I have denoted this one as the 10 percent, 10 percent of the colloidal particles which will refuse to settle down or to be removed in the in, in the in the sedimentation tank okay so they they still remain that 10 percent of the solid solid colloidal solids will remain in water and the best way to remove them is by sand filters so the sand filters is essentially to remove any remaining colloidal suspension Disinfection is by, to kill the bacteria and virus and to make the water safe, safe for drinking. Then ha having introduced with disinfection, which means chlorine or chloramine or ozone or ultraviolet ray, or it can be chlorine dioxide, One, any one of those, when you add it to the water, you are able to remove or, or and actually kill the bacteria, bacteria and viruses and make the water safe for consumption. So in order to make sure that these are all, uh, the water is safe, what they do is after injecting the disinfectant, they will keep the water in, in contact with the disinfectant for a certain period of time. And that, that unit is known as clear water storage. Okay, once you have permitted the water to be remain, remain in the clear water storage for a certain period of time, after that, they will take samples to make sure that the bacterial population is not there. OK, yeah, to ensure that the water quality is free from bacteria. Once it is established, then of course you can pump the water into service reservoirs. OK. Yeah, the merits and the limitations of conventional water treatment for public uh, water supply. The merits is conventional treatment method are simple. OK, and cost effective because you're treating a large volume of water every day. OK, so therefore you cannot afford to spend so much money. So actually conventional treatment is ideally suited for uh, to, to, to produce drinkable water or, or portable water at very cost effective uh, method. Actually, the the conventional treatment is a very cost effective method for treating the water for large volume. OK, it is not uh, used for small uh, industrial applications, but whereas when your PUB is treating water for the entire population, they need to ensure that it is cost effective. OK, so in this case, the 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 total the prices for the treated water is about one dollar forty somewhere closer to one dollar forty cents. Okay, yeah. So you can see that it is relatively ch uh, uh, cheaper to produce the water at that cost. Okay, the limitations of the conventional treatment is not capable of removing dissolved contaminants. So if there is anything which has already got dissolved into water, and if the, so the dissolved solid concentration increases, it is not possible to utilize or use the conventional treatment to remove them. OK, so this is the answer, a complete answer for this question. What is the question? Again, going through with an aid of a schematic diagram, explain the conventional treatment process and highlight its advantages and limitations. OK. And any questions on this one? Any questions? Come on. Yeah. 
Are you very clear with the treatment process? Uh, sorry, sir, just one question. Uh, sir. Wait, wait, a, wait a minute. Huh? Let me. Because my laptop is having a problem. The speaker is not working well. Okay. Yeah. Can you please repeat the question? Yeah, okay. Um, I, I think just now you mentioned about the disadvantage of that uh, treatment process. Yeah. Um, disadvantage being that it is not capable of removing, treating, removing the, you know, the dissolved. Dissolved salts, yes. Salts. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I thought that you explained earlier that uh one of the process uh, actually does does that uh, meaning uh, removing the dissolved uh, impurities so it can impurities. be removed yeah it can be removed by two methods one is actually uh, distillation which means actually you are permitting the water to be evaporated and condensed and also you can purify that water that is one method, but it cannot be applied for public water supply because it's, it is it can only be used for small quantity of water productions. Okay, so the the second method by which you can you can uh, uh, provide uh, uh, to uh, to man uh, actually to treat the water is by conventional treatment. Conventional treatment has a limitation because if you have water which is already salty, which means already salt content is there in the form of dissolved salt, that one you cannot remove it by conventional treatment because if you have water, uh, dissolved contaminants in water, the best treatment that you can give is through membranes, RO system, reverse osmosis. Okay, so why are we not converting all our treatment plants to into reverse? Uh, 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 we can call it as the membrane technique uh, technology to be implemented. The reason is that the RO systems are, require very high pressure, which means it is uh, it uh, actually the the amount of water that has to be pressurized through the membrane requires a lot of energy, which means it it is a energy consu consuming or it can you can call it as a energy intensive uh, treatment system. OK, so it, that can uh, the, nowadays I think you can use it because it is being used for production of new water. OK, so you can use it, but conventional treatment at the moment OK, most of the treatment plants are following the same conventional method, which is removal of particles and disinfection. That is the two activities which are taking place for, for conventional treatment. So, but, but, but new water is using membrane technology. So because the membrane cut prices have come down, and uh, there are many manufacturers of uh, various types of membrane. So membrane technology is making things easier. OK, but conventional treatment plant cannot be quickly converted into a uh, membrane based technique, uh, treatment technique. So it re at the moment, conventional treatments are predominant in Singapore's water supply. Predominant means actually if we have five treatment plants and all five treatment plants are, are, are conventional treatment. Okay, conventional treatment. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay, if not, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, yeah, so I, so this uh, answer for this question has been sent to you. OK, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through what we have learned so far. OK. OK. Yeah. 
Okay, this is just to recapitulate what, what we have learned for today's in today's lesson. The first question. I think. <clears throat> okay. Why do conventional treatment for public water water supply? What is the main reason why you want to adopt conventional treatment for public water supply? OK, the reason is basically. The reason why we are adopting the conventional treatment is because we have to treat the water. A large volume of water for public supply. OK, it is not. Yeah, actually for every day. Uh, I think it is about. Uh, yeah, about uh, 60 swimming pool. Uh, Volume, which are usually a swimming pool will contain at least about 2000 or two, 3000 meter cube of water. OK, so the PUB is capable of uh, of uh, treating water for the entire population. Each uh, each person is actually per head consumption at the moment is 165, 165, 1.65 or 165 liters of water per day. That is the current consumption for for the for a public water supply. Okay, so the the second reason why we are adopting the conventional treatment is because it is cost effective. Okay, why? Because we are using very little chemicals. Only we are using alum, and we use uh, chlorine or ozone. All these are cost effective and also we reasonable uh, cost uh, you can produce water. The conventional treatment also uses simple techniques, which means sedimentation, uh, flocculation, all these are very simple techniques to so that that it, you can purify the water with minimum cost. Use a small or very little quantity of chemicals. I as I told you, the cardinal rule of water treatment is that if you are able to treat the water by natural means, which means by natural sedimentation, natural um, uh, sedimentation, uh, and using very little chemicals, okay, so that uh, makes the process more cause uh, more more easier to uh, and it can be because of the larger volume that you are going to treat. It must be cost effective. OK, so these are the four reasons why Singapore and the PUB still continue to con continue to operate OK conventional treatment plants. We have five treatment plants. Only Chestnut Avenue treatment plant is using membrane. All others are using the traditional uh, flocculation, coagulation, sedimentation, disinfection, and then yeah, pump the water to the consumer. So, so this is part is conventional treatment. So, one of the questions that we can you need to answer: Why do we or PUB is resorting to conventional treatment for public water supply? What are the two main activities of the treatment? Conventional treatment. Only two things that we do. Remove all solid particles. So OK, so solid particles which are present in natural water are, are categorized into three grid particles, suspended solids, or colloidal solids. So in this process, we are removing all the solid particles which are present in water. And we cannot take away. In other words, we cannot segregate the. The. the bacterial population, what we can do is to kill the bacteria using disinfectant. So only two activities are conducted in a conventional treatment plant. There are many units which can remove all the solid particles. After that, you need to disinfect the water and pass the water to the consumers. What are the limitations of the conventional treatment? The limitation is conventional treatment technique is not a capable of removing dissolved salts. OK, conventional treatment is not capable of removing dissolved solids. OK, so this is a drawback. This is the limitation. If your water or the raw water contains high concentration of dissolved salts, 
then you can forget about treating it through the conventional treatment because the salt content cannot be removed. OK, yeah. What what is the Sir, I have one question. Yeah. This is Mrs. Priti. Yes, yes. OK, yes. sorry to join in a bit later. Hi, class. Yeah, um, I had one question yes. for, on behalf of the class. Okay. Uh, sir, if we just do the 11 questions that you are giving us today, enough yeah. to cover the entire content that we have done. Yeah, I think uh, this covers only only for today's lecture. OK, so don't have to study anything more for exam. Uh, I, I, I think I Virtually, I think uh, I'm just discussing the co possible questions and answers. OK, yeah. <laughs> OK, uh, hi, good evening entire class. I'm Mrs. Priti. I'll be co-teaching the module later. Sorry, I won't take much of your time. Just joking. Huh? Uh, although Mr. Sata has is so good to give you all a list of questions for the topics that he has done. Please make sure that in addition to the questions, you also study the contents of the topic. OK, so that is how we all get knowledge, right? OK, so apologies that I joined in a bit late. Um, actually, I am COVID positive and have not been feeling well. Somehow today is the day I have not been feeling well. So I actually dozed off uh, after some medication. So I joined you all about 10 minutes back. So okay. I, how are you all doing? Class? Yeah. Good. Good. Um, it's good. It's good. Miss Pretty is pretty good. OK, hope it's good and you're enjoying. So I will join you all from time to time and Mr. Sata will be taking the first part and I'll see you all later part that is after June. Yeah, okay? after, after the break, after the after the break, after yeah. the common test, after the break. So I will deal with you in terms of wastewater treatment, but some of the questions that you are also discussing now in terms of treatment, some unit processes and all, it will still be something similar. It won't be totally different. Yeah. yeah. OK, so enjoy your class. Uh, okay. I will stay silent for the time being. Sorry to disturb uh, Mr. Sata. I just no. actually I wanted to chip in when you showed the big figure and I wanted to say teacher very, very difficult figure, but I think <laughs> you quickly move through. <laughs> yeah. It's OK, I, I think you can get well and come back. <laughs> yeah, take, yeah. Care of, take care and. <clears throat> OK, yeah. all right. Enjoy your class. OK, Thank all you. right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. OK, so. What is the water quality for pre prerequisite for conventional treatment? If you are going to use a conventional treatment, what should your water should be? The water that contains no solids or minimum dissolved salts. OK, that is what the what is required. And this is what uh, the, we call it as a shortage of water for Singapore. Actually, in, in reality, we don't right around Singapore. You have plenty of water, OK, in the sea. OK, it's a sea of water which is available. But why are we seeking water from Malaysia? Because the, those are the water which is which is collected, which is collected in an impounding reservoir. And those water that is being collected and preserved OK, uh, and it is easier for you to use them in the conventional treatment because there is no need for you to remove the dissolved salt. There may be a little bit of dissolved solids it will be inside the water. It is already dissolved, but the concentrations are very, very low. OK, so therefore that's the reason why what we call as the water problem of Singapore, because we are looking for sources of water which has low con concentration of dissolved solid solids okay so so naturally we are seeking for that and that is where the problem really is okay what are the what are the water quality prerequisite for the conventional treatment water that contains no solids or minimum dissolved solids the rainwater collected in importing reservoirs, rainwater flowing in rivers are also similar characteristics. So which means they also have very low dissolved content. OK, so they can be utilized for the conventional treatment. OK, now. <coughs> 
So five processes are considered as, as uh, pre-treatment. Pre-treatment means before the water goes into the into the process of removing solids. Okay, before that, okay, we have to do this. These are all part of the treatment uh, chain. The raw water storage can be considered as a uh, as a treatment unit. Aeration. Aeration is actually very important because it can remove uh, micropollutants like uh, pesticides, uh, insecticides, and all the, all the micropollutants can be removed. And, and to remove them, uh, aeration is the best way to remove them. Then, of course, bar screening is important to remove the large objects. Grit removal has to be done because otherwise grit particles will settle down inside the piping and block the water flow. Then finally, you also need to pre-chlorinate, which means before you that water goes through the treatment process, you need to introduce chlorine and make sure that the, the chlorine content is able to uh, purify the water and disinfect the water that is going into the treatment plant okay so five of them are considered as uh, pre-treatment uh, considered as pre-treatment okay yeah then yeah give two reasons why raw water storage is considered as a pre-treatment because it reduces the turbidity of by natural sedimentation reduces the number of pathogenic bacteria it also oxidizes the manganese, okay? It is also reduces organic nitrogen, okay? So these are, these are occurring in what we call raw water storage, okay? So I will explain this, this term called raw water storage. What does that mean? Okay, it, a good example of this raw water storage is Bedok Reservoir. Bedok Reservoir is not a natural reservoir. It is a man-made reservoir. How do the water come? Water is all pumped from the pond, which is eight ponds and also one retention pond there in Nishun, Nishun, and at the same time, they have eight ponds within, within uh, Bedok, where they retain the water and then they pump the water into the, in, into the Bedok Reservoir. So the Bedok Reservoir virtually collects the water, <coughs> collects the water, and it retains the water for a, uh, for a for a for a longer period of time. And during this this duration of uh, water retained in the Vedok reservoir, you will see a lot of sedimentation taking place. So it will reduce the turbidity and natural by sedimentation. So these are the reasons why we call it as a raw water storage. Okay, so raw water storage is one of the one of the pre-treatment methods to to reduce the natural turbidity, pathogenic population by oxidation of iron and manganese and also reduction of organic nitrogen will also take place in raw water storage. State three methods for removing grid particles. Grid particles can be removed in velocity controlled grid channels, aerated grid channel chamber and also grid grid traps, which is a spiral design. I will explain them later, but these are the three methods, okay? Why pre-chlorinate water beyond the breakpoint? This is another question, okay? Because breakpoint chlorination destroys all pathogens. Breakpoint chlorination removes planktons and chloramines, which are giving taste and, taste and odor problems. Okay, so breakpoint break chlorination is quite important. And what is breakpoint chlorination? I think we will deal that in, in, in the next lecture, next Wednesday. We, I, we, I will go through this, this uh, term called breakpoint chlorination. Okay, so that is important because it is only after breakpoint uh, chlorination you will be able to see free chlorines which are available for as a protection for the water until it reaches the consumer. Okay, so this one I have not covered yet, but I think let's go through this uh, question, okay, for the moment. Why remove grid particles from raw water? 
The great particles are sand, broken glasses, silt, pebbles, and all these are called grit. Grit, normally, if you let the water with the grit particles, it will go and damage the pump because it will start abrasing. In other words, it will, it will cause scratching of the impellers. Okay, and thereby it can cause mechanical damage. Okay, so grit particles also will settle in corners and bends. Okay, where, where it will quickly settle down and block the flow through the piping. And this is uh, what is known as clogging of pipes. Okay, so grit particles should be removed as a, as a priority, which means so the first thing that, that you need to get rid of is grit particles. Okay. Why aerate raw water prior to chemical treatment? Now, aeration is able to take away all the volatile organic uh, compounds. So it reduces the taste and odor producing compounds, removes carbon dioxide, which also causes corrosion, okay? Expels the dissolved gases. So in, the, in this case, if you have, if your water source is from a reservoir, there will be methane dissolved gas in, in, in the water. Why? Because methane is produced from the bottom of the reservoir. The bottom of the reservoir, you have very little oxygen. So there will be anaerobic activities which will generate, which will generate uh, odorous gases like H, a hydrogen sulfide, H2S, sulfur dioxide, methane, all these will be generated and they get dissolved into the water. So the best way to get rid of them is aeration. Okay, so once you aerate, then of course the dissolved contents, okay, can be volatile organic compounds can be expelled from the water body. Oxidation of iron and manganese because aeration are uh, a process where you are bringing in contact, the oxygen in contact with the with water and the oxidation normally can oxidize iron and manganese, which are normally present in water. Okay, raw water. Okay. So these are my answers. Okay. Okay. I think that, that I think that is all the, for the question and answers. Okay, let me. Okay. Right. How do you distribute the water? Yeah. Now, how do you distribute the water to the public? <coughs> How do you, how do the water comes to your doorstep? Anyone? Anyone can, uh, can answer this question. How does the water come to your doorstep? Is it through pumping, sir? Pumping? By pumping? Yeah, through use of high pressure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pumping, there are some, some, uh, Supply is by direct pumping, there it is so. But the normal way by which you can sort of supply the water to the consumers is by after the treatment, which is uh, after removing the particles and removing, uh, killing the bacteria. And you provide a little bit of chlorine also to make sure that the water is safely taken all the way from the treatment plant right up to your doorstep. The, the protection is provided by chlorine residual. And normally after your treatment, the water will be pumped to the service reservoirs. Okay, so actually when you are looking at the Singapore supply, water supply, it is divided into three, three, uh, three components. Okay, Eastern water supply, that is this one. Western water supply is here, and the central supply is really uh, in the middle. Okay, yeah. So we we uh, normally we will also have treatment plants within the close proximity to the source. So we all have about five 
treatment plant. The sixth treatment plant is in Pulau Tekong, that is completely a separate one. But in within the mainland, you can have the first one is actually Chachukang treatment plant. Then you have the uh, uh, Chestnut Avenue treatment plant by the side of this reservoir. Then you have uh, Woodley treatment plant. Bukitima treatment plant is right behind the Istana, okay, on the, uh, and right in front of the KK hospitals. You have another treatment plant. This was the first treatment plant which was built in Singapore. Okay, so we have five, one, two, three, four, five treatment plants for the main, main land. Okay, now all these five are, all these five are conventional treatment plants. Okay, so the sector is divided in the, into three categories. So how are they supplying? Now they take the water from these sources, which means they are taking from Karanji, Pandan, Murai, okay, Tenga, and also Jirong Lake. All these are main sources of water, and all these reservoirs, containing this water will be pumped into the into the treatment plant and they do they don't take all the water from the same one single reservoir they don't do that because what happens is you take the water from any any three of them or more than that and you blend the water why do you want to blend the water sometimes some of these uh, uh, the, treat, uh, the reservoirs may have uh, different concentrations of, of uh, dissolved content. Okay, sometimes you, you may find that the pandan uh, treatment uh, reservoir will have a higher concentration. When you mix this with the water that is you are pumping from Karanji reservoir, there is a mutual dilution of the contaminant because if the contaminant is a higher proportion, then of course when you mix it with the other water sources, the, the concentrations will become less. So we call this as a blending. It is like blending. The, the reason for blending is to mutually reduce the concentration by dilution. Okay, you take water from here, from here and here and mix it together. Uh, so you can see sometimes sulfate will be high on this, uh, this uh, so water source. Whereas here you may have chlorides which will be high. When you mix these two together, there is a mutual diversion, dilution which will take place. Okay, so having blended the water, it goes through the treatment plant at Sochokong treatment plant. And once you have completed the treatment, the water is pumped into the high, uh, the service reservoirs which are located at high locations within Singapore. You can see that uh, Jurong Hill is uh, where you have a big tank in, in, the, in the vicinity, and it is supplying the water to the Chachukang, from Chachukang treatment plant. The water is coming into Jurong Hill service reservoir and then it is it is being distributed. Uh, Nanyang, uh, Kenridge, or actually Nian Poly gets the water from Kenridge service reservoir. And in addition to that, from Mount Faber, which is also, you has a very high elevated reservoir tank, okay, which we call it as service reservoirs. Okay, so the service reservoirs will be filled with the treated water and from the service reservoirs, the transmission lines will be taking the water to the doorstep. So this is your Western supply. Then for the central supply, you take water from Macritchie, Upper Pierce and Upper Selita, and you treat them in three treatment plants, which is Bhaktima, Chestnut Avenue and Woodley. This, the water is shared there between them and then once it is treated, the water is pumped to the elevated, elevated service reservoir in Fort Canning, Pearls Hill. You can see that uh, for the China, Chinatown, the water is essentially distributed from Pearls Hill. Okay, orchard area is being, the, the, the water is available from 
food canning service reservoir. So these are service reservoirs are being located at elevated locations because it must provide a hydraulic pressure for the water to move into the distribution piping. OK, so central supply is this. And then we have the another one, which is eastern supply, where the, the water is taken from Sungai Selita, which is actually nowadays called as Upper Selita Reservoir and Bedok Reservoir that being treated at Bedok Treatment Plant, and it is supplying the water to the service reservoir in Mariam and also Jalan Yunos. OK, so this, this uh, combination, source, treatment, reservoir. Source, treatment, reservoir. You take water, blend it. OK, you don't take the water from only one source. You take water from two of the sources and then, of course, blend it. OK, so that the contaminants will be diluted. And then your treatment plant which treats the water is, is, is uh, indicated here. And once the treatment is over, it will be pumped into the service reservoirs. OK, so you can see. These are the three major supply. Uh, divisions within the PUB, OK. OK. Uh, yeah, because. So you can see that we have altogether five main uh, treatment uh, plant. OK, one at Chachukang, one at uh, Chestnut Avenue. The other one is at Woodley and the other is at Bukitima treatment, Bukitima uh, treatment uh, plant. And then we have one major one which is actually in the Bidok area. And that is a treatment plant which takes water from Bedok uh, Reservoir and then treat the water and supply to the eastern sector, which means uh, the airport and other places where the water is coming from Bedok treatment plant. OK, so these are basically just to give you an idea of how the. Distribution system is structured in Singapore. OK. OK. So what I will now do. Wait a second. I'm just going to show you a typical conventional treatment plan. OK, now this is a typical. A treatment plant, OK. Are you able to hear the sound? Sound is not there. OK, you can have a look at this treatment plant. And where does this water go into after feeding? Directly. So this is the second one, separate, separate uh, treatment. Or from here. No, here uh, we are adding uh, lime. Yeah. Because we have a sep another line coming to the area. Okay, okay. So this line we are adding lime on the top hmm. and the alum here. Okay. That's what the 
First structure built in 1962. This one? Yeah. The chamber was there. Was there. Yeah. Can I have this one and And this pulsator is. Is this also going into the pulsator or is no. it distributed directly into? Yeah, it is uh, from distribution chamber, it is just a direct path to the pulsator. Or oh, from here? Yes. Yeah, from yes. this distribution chamber. Okay, so this one goes to the two clarifiers. The two, two, two clarifiers. So the flocculation, you do it inside the center? Yeah. Or inside the... In the part. Oh, so it's... Both flocculation and... Flocculation. Yeah. And sedimentation. Yeah. So you don't have a 